Hello, I hope all of you are doing well in this increasingly insane world we live in. You've got to be feeling it as well, right? It's getting weird out there. So I've spent the last few weeks preparing the course that Richard Grennan and I created. It's called Narcissistic Cults Decoded, and it's now available. It's almost eight hours of video in three main sections. It's a monster of a course. Um, the first section is breaking down my experience of getting into Nixium and other cults. And then Richard introduces a framework of seven phases of narcissistic psychopathic abuse. In the second section, we take a deep dive into the life cycle of narcissistic cult abuse, step by step, going deep into the structure of the psychology, uh, what effect it has on the target, and why it's designed this way. And then in the third section, we work entirely on solutions, the real authentic way that a person can escape and actually move on with their lives. Just so you know, it's not heavy on technical jargon. It's just the essentials of what people will need to heal and move on. So I'm super proud of what we've created, and I think it'll give people two very concrete things. One is a very clear understanding of what they went through and perhaps why, and the tools and awareness to avoid these kinds of people moving forward. Let's just say that Richard and I learned a lot from each other while recording this course. I'm going to put the details in the show notes if you'd like access. Before we get into the episode, I'd like to extend a big thank you to my Patreon members. Also, I know many people ask me questions on social media, and I really do wish I could get to all of them, but I'm still just, you know, a one-man band. Just know that I do go very deep into questions and thoughts with my Patreon subscribers, and it's always, you know, food for thought for all of us. One quick ask, wherever you listen to or watch this podcast, please subscribe, and if you feel so inclined, give me a good rating. It helps more people find my stuff. So, this episode with Sarma was a particularly emotional and painful episode. Sarma is someone who is still in the midst of the fallout from being fooled by a con man and being the subject of the TV show Bad Vegan. Let's just say we went deep. This episode will be especially helpful for people who have been in narcissistically abusive relationships and have a hard time explaining to others what was done to them. I find that society can be very unkind to survivors. Dr. Evan Stark, who literally wrote the book on coercive control and coined the term, was interviewed for the series. Unfortunately, it never made it into the cut, but in the unused footage, he said the following, if I'd had any involvement in her case, she never would have gone to jail. Here's my discussion with Sarma Melngalis. So I am so thrilled that you decided to come on this podcast. Thank you. Uh, I have been watching your story from afar. You and I had a conversation a little while back. And I have to be honest with you, it's been so painful to see what has been done to you in the press, in the public. It's been so painful that I think I told you I couldn't even watch Bad Vegan. I, yeah, I, I appreciate that. It just hurt, you know? Um, and I kind of, my audience probably knows who you are. Mm-hmm. But would you mind just giving us the, the sort of the short version of, you know, what you went through, um, just so the people that don't know have a sense of it? Yeah. Um, so I had a restaurant and a business in New York City um, that were pretty high profile for a restaurant, and, uh, and uh, it was called Pure Food Wine. And um, we had a, a business called One, One Lucky Duck. It was sort of a lifestyle brand offshoot. And it was growing and growing, and it was really special and unique. And we'd been there for more than 10 years, so we were really well established. Um, but I was in a position of being kind of very overwhelmed. So as many entrepreneurs know, like you kind of get to a phase where you're about, you, you could kind of take off and grow, but you need to find the right partners. And, and so anyway, I was very overwhelmed, and I also... Um, uh, had just broken up with probably the best, you know, one of the best relationships um, in my past, a very like no drama, lovely, loving, amazing relationship um, with a guy who was much younger. And so I was feeling, you know, kind of heartbroken for the first time in my entire life. And I think as your audience probably knows, you are kind of most vulnerable when you are in one of those situations where you're experiencing, a, you know, you experienced a loss or there's some sort of challenge all, the, you know, combined with I was overwhelmed um, and then just kind of certain things about my personality and who I am and whatnot. But this guy came into my life that I met um, via Twitter and he had that sort of false 
validation because I thought he was a friend of um, somebody who I was friends with um, and got into my head and the, the relationship started uh, via online and then basically digital, you know, communications via direct message and then we exchanged numbers and text message and then it was, you know, and then we spoke on the phone. And so it was a while before I met him, um, but that kind of allowed him to do a number on me before I'd even met him. Um, and then he came into my life and it's this slow process. It, it actually was, you know, he was in my life for years in the beginning sort of on and off, but basically he came in and, um, you know, much like a cult leader does, sort of took over in various ways, um, kind of my mind and my life and extracted all kinds of money out of me. And it became a situation that I couldn't get out of and never knew what to believe. And, um, uh, and then, you know, he kind of, he basically took down my whole business and, uh, you know, my, my mother also, he, he got her involved and got a huge amount of money out of her, much of which she had also borrowed. And so what he got out of me was also ultimately borrowed, but also destroyed the whole business. But kind of worst of all, made it look like I had done it. Um, and it, I mean, it was just gut-wrenchingly painful because that place was, was so incredibly special. Um, you know, it was one of those companies where people worked there for years and years and years. Um, it really, you know, it sounds like a cliche, but it really was like a family. Um, and so he, he just kind of came in and bulldozed through it. And even saying that, like, I'm so, I'm always so paranoid about how I speak about it because I'm so used to people kind of lumping this shame on me for not being remorseful enough, not saying I'm sorry, not taking responsibility. So that's like something that I struggle with anytime I talk about the situation. Um, but, uh, and anyway, so my whole business was destroyed and he took me away. Um, and I was gone for like nine months in this very bizarre kind of dissociated road trip from hell. Um, eventually we were arrested, which is what got me out of it. Um, and I mean, I'm so grateful that that happened. Um, and I actually feel incredibly, I mean, the, the, the detective who arrested me was great. He was great. He, he kind of read the situation. And, um, you know, I just remember him saying to me, like, it's over now. Like, as of like, don't worry, it's over now, which is not something you say to a criminal you're arresting. You know what I mean? You don't treat them the way that they treated me very kindly. Um, and, uh, and then, so then I was brought back to New York and uh, tran and he was arrested too. This guy and I call him I call him Mr. Fox because I originally knew him as one name, uh, which was Shane Fox, and then later on I found out his real name was something else. Um, but sort of continued to think of him as Shane Fox, and also you know because most people in these situations they they tend to kind of have a nickname for their their the person. It's just easier to call them something, and so Mr. Fox almost sounds like a fictional character. So that's how I refer to him. Um, so we were both, uh, we were charged, we were both charged criminally for what happened with my business, but kind of charged as like co-conspirators. Meanwhile, he benefited from everything. I lost everything. Um, and, you know, I lost everything and more. I've, I'm still, I mean, there's piles and piles of debt I have to deal with. Um, and he's off continuing to do what he does. Uh, we were both prosecuted equally. He, uh, I got out on bail, and um, he did not. So he stayed in jail. And I just naively thought, like, well, surely once they look into this, um, you know, they'll see that, like, why, why in the, like, logically, why would I destroy my own business? Why would I do these things? It makes no sense. And then also kind of the more evidence they find, the better. Um, they even... Uh, found a journal of mine. Once I saw that, I was like, okay, well, but anyway, they, they never eased up on prosecuting me. And I ended up pleading guilty, which, you know, so if you've been through the criminal justice system or understand it at all, people, lots of people are very aware that pleading guilty does not mean whatsoever that you are in fact guilty of those crimes. It just means that that was, you know, that was the easier thing to do or the wiser thing to do or the safer thing to do. Um, and, you know, I, I wasn't going to go through a trial. I didn't have the money for that or the time or the stomach. Um, 
so and, and also i mean i realize now i was still kind of i was still very much in a state of shock even you know as you know it takes a really long time to sort of yes. come down out of these things and unwind out of it so um i ended up getting sentenced to do four months but he got out before i had to go in so they set him free out in the world to continue doing what he does and then i had to go spend four months back at rikers and um uh yeah and then got out you know i have so many questions um mm -hmm. i just want to pick up real quick like what what was rikers like i mean what was that like for you um god it's i mean i feel like there's a whole I actually may write a second book and write a lot about my experience there because it's a very mixed bag. I mean, it's there's all kinds of terrible things about it, but, um, you know, four months, I also, you know, four months is not that long compared to what I know sometimes other people get. And so I feel grateful that it was not that long, but long enough that it still sucked. And um, and I got to kind of experience what it, what it was really like to be there for a while. And, um, you know, but in other ways, I, I was still, you know, on the other side of it, it's not like I was coming out and, and could celebrate. I was coming out to face, like, my life having been destroyed, all my stuff gone. What am I going to do now? How am I going to possibly rebuild and earn enough money to repay people, which, you know, I'm on the hook for, not right. him. And, um, and so there was some element of... Um, a weird kind of psychological safety in there because I didn't have to face mm -hmm. my real world problems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, um, the the experience of like waking up to the realization that you'd been conned, which you said kind of happened when you got arrested. Like, what was that like? That wake up experience. Um. I was thinking about that. It, it, there was no moment because even the weird thing is, and I'll, you know, there's so many things I'll never have actual answers for, but, um, he said to me shortly before we were arrested, kind of, I don't know if it was the day before, if it was that morning, but I remember, and it's, it's interesting because there's so much that I forget, but there's little snippets I remember. And I remember it because it was really creepy. He said to me, there's going to be one more gut shot. Like I'm going to have to endure one more test because everything he did to me was, um, you know, and I, I re-listened to your episode about like, what is a cult? And those, you, you went through the whole list of things and it's just every single one. Yep, exactly. Yep, exactly. Yep, exactly. It's just, you know, in some cases slightly different because it wasn't a whole group of people. Right. Um, but he kind of always had me... Uh, he, he sort of made it as if I, I was, he was kind of putting me through all these tests and I had to pass these tests. And so um, when he said there's going to be one more gut shot, he sort of was telling me like, you're going to have to endure one more really gut wrenching, painful thing before this is all over. And, um, and I just remember feeling like, oh God, what's coming, you know? And, um, and then, oh. and then, you know, it was like, I don't know if it was the next day, if it was later that day, but um and, and we were in separate hotel rooms that were adjoined. So he, he was arrested. I didn't even know he was arrested. And I just heard a commotion in the hallway and went and opened the door and saw these police officers. Leon was with me and he was barking like crazy. So we saw these officers and then, um, you know, they realized who I was and they came in and, um, and you know, very kindly arrested me. They didn't, you know, throw me in handcuffs or anything like yeah, that. They yeah, were yeah. extremely kind to me. So... Can you describe, and this is mostly for your audience, because I feel like I'm starting to really get a grasp of this. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Mr. Fox, let's call him. Yeah. He fabricated a fantasy world yeah. that he invited you into and convinced you was true. Yeah. And, and I mean, the way that he did it is something I've been sort of piecing together, but it, it took a really long time. And if you asked me to explain like, well, what precisely did he get you to believe? I wouldn't even be able to tell you because it was so slow and gradual and like who he was would sort of morph from what he originally told me to then sort of this more 
like, you know, he had these powers. And then at first it was like he had these powers because he was part of some secret organization that gave him the powers. Then it sort of slowly morphed into like, no, no, he has these powers because he knows what I'm thinking and mm -hmm. he sees everything and he has these, you know, powers that I couldn't explain. And it just got deeper and deeper. And, um, you know, so much of what he got me to believe was via things he implied, not said directly, you know? Mm -hmm. So, and, you know, one thing I don't understand um, is in all the, the stories that I've watched and other, you know, people's scenarios that I've read about that are similar, um, I, I haven't come across one where somebody was pushing back as much as I was because I was able to recover a lot of our communications um, not all of them, but some of them, um, over a long period of time. So I was able to recover our G chats, right? Which was like this function in Gmail that people used to use kind of like, you right. know, messaging on the computer. Right. Um, but I don't have the vast majority of our text messages or he had deleted all of our emails. Um, so I've used that to kind of piece things together and I, it's reading it. It's shocking how much I was pushing back on him, calling him a liar, you know, insulting him. But then, you know, he would come in, but then the, the chats would stop and presumably, you know, he came back home because he was always kind of in and out of my life. He wasn't like living in my house with me in the beginning. Um, and so then, he, you know, I would, but then according to my records, it's like, then I would send him a wire, right? So whatever mm -hmm. he did in person, then I would send him a wire. Mm -hmm. But I don't know what those conversations were. So, um, I, I mean, I think because I wasn't, there was no like wake up moment because even when yeah. I was arrested, I thought like, well, maybe, you know, he had sort of in a way almost prepped me for it because I remember he used to say like, he would always say like, whatever you do, don't ever throw me under the bus. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we have to, you know, it, united we stand or like, uh, like I would mm -hmm. always have to stay on his side. We always had to be united and then everything would be fine. If I pull, if I broke away from him, then, you know, my life yeah. would be doomed. So yeah. um, he definitely instilled that fear in me that, you know, if I didn't do what he said or if I betrayed him in some way, uh, yeah. you know, like it would be doomsday. So I was really, you know, I didn't know, uh, you know, I mean, I, I, it's not like I was brought into a room and questioned immediately. It, it was quite a while before. Um, uh, well, I actually never spoke directly to, to the prosecutors, but um, it was sort of this slow process of like, oh God, like what's happening now and mm. what do I do? And, and, and kind of not even really understanding what had happened and sort of very slowly trying yeah. to figure it out. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like, and I really know what this is like. It sounds like he did something to your head that he really fucked with you. I mean, like the, the fact that you can't recall exactly how you went from having resistance to a bunch of things and questioning to doing a wire transfer. And I know what that's like, because I remember there were conversations I'd, I'd have with Ranieri where I went in to have a conversation about something I thought was a problem. And when I walked out, it wasn't a problem anymore. Right. And I'm like, but it is a problem. It was almost like this hypnotic induction thing had happened. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think that some of them, some of these con artists are very, very skilled at that. Yeah. And the other thing I, I wanted to ask you was, you know, I talk about in, in my in my video, what is it called? You know, you know, data mining, like they f yeah. find out what you want. Yep. And then they give it to you. Right. So what was that process like? They say, yeah, exactly. They say they're going to give um, it to you. Well, I mean, I, I was a pretty good target looking back because not only I mean, I was um, I had a on my website, there was like a tab. Uh, I think it was like I think it was called Ask Sarma, but there was like a Sarma tab on our on our website that was basically my personal blog, all kinds of stuff, and I had all these blog posts from the past, um, and some of them were incredibly personal, mm -hmm. and I think that that's you know because I was always very open, I think that's what created our really strong um, sort of base of you know, customers, people who bought our products, followed our stuff. And that was helpful for me because all of those people, because of everything that I wrote online, knew me well and knew how much that business meant to me and they knew how hard I worked. So they knew when all of this kind of exploded in the tabloids and 
there was all these people who were like, yeah, she would never have done that to her own business. Mm -hmm. So they knew. Mm -hmm. So it was that was helpful. But um, for him, it was like a roadmap of to my psyche. Um, I mean, there's one post in particular that I recently reread that was basically I was like outlining my frustrations and everything that I struggled with and my hopes and dreams and what was kind of in the way. And um, I mean, it was just like all you need was to read that and you'd go, oh, OK, I understand her exactly. Mm. Um, mm. I mean, all my insecurities were in there, all my frustrations, everything that I wanted to overcome and rebuild and whatnot. And so he basically preyed on my, you know, he 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 made it seem like via him I could be um, sort of freed from the past. Like I could be enabled to then grow my business into what I really wanted it to be. And I always felt really strongly that it it was meant to be this sort of you know, bigger and bigger and bigger business as it was on track to be, that yeah. would really make a difference in the world as far as people, um, you know, it was a raw vegan restaurant, that was our concept. But to me, it was really about, you know, showing people that very clean food, you know, what it does for your health and the, the environment and, and whatnot. So it was this big sort of, you know, our brand was really kind of encouraging a shift. And that's what I, I wanted to do on a on a much larger scale yeah. um, and so he knew that I had that kind of ambition which again I know is also very typical in the sort of cult world where you just have that like you want to make the world a better place you want to do yeah. really good things and then they take that and you know kind of use it against you um, yeah. and so he made it seem like I mean I remember him telling me once you know you have no idea you you don't even understand how important your business is like mm. it's so important like he made me believe that like he somehow knew that it was even more of a world changing thing than i knew and so it was as if he was protecting me and making sure that no like shady investors got in and cuz i i had i'd almost gotten in trouble once with some investors who would have kind of taken the brand and done that very corporate thing mm. and, and kind of destroyed it in the process. And I was always so nervous about that and running that business by myself, essentially. I mean, I had amazing you know, people working there with me and whatnot, but kind of being the only one at the top responsible. Um, you know, I, I had a lot of like men coming to me saying they wanted to invest and then they would mm -hmm. turn out to be kind of icky. And so I just mm -hmm. was like really frustrated um, mm -hmm. and wanted that like, you know, just wanted to stand up and grow this business and do it you know do it the right way like with my sort of family of people behind me yeah. and and not turn it into some kind of corporate thing that yeah. was was just all about profits and so yeah. he he knew that's what i really wanted and dreamed of and um i remember one of the things i could i i really could not make sense of and i couldn't understand is um you know, people people would say like, "Oh, you you must have been in love with him, and therefore you did it did what you did for love." And it's like, no, 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 yes. I wasn't in love with him. But then when I look back at my correspondence, there were plenty of times when I would reply to him and say, "I love you." Yes. Um, what's funny though is how many times I found in writing where he said he would say like, "You love me," you know, like he would he would kind yeah. of tell me that I love him, um, and I, but I couldn't quite understand like, well, why would I say that I love him, and why? And it was, you know, I don't remember what podcast, but somewhere you explained, um, and I, I transcribed it and wrote it down. I might have put yeah. it in my book draft, but um, where you said it's like they, they present kind of who you really want to be. Yeah. And then that's what, you, it's more of like an attachment, you know? Yeah. So that's interesting you say that because in, it, with the film that I'm finishing right now, Empathy Not Included, which I mentioned to you, mm -hmm. you know, I've interviewed a lot of self-confessed narcissists. And one of them said, you know, you don't fall in love with me. Um, you fall in love with yourself. I basically take the best of your attributes. I mirror them back to you. And you go like, oh, that's what I want. And that's what you fall in love with. Mm -hmm. You know, not me. Because they're, 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 they tend to be an empty shell. And I was going to ask you that because my assumption was that you were not in love with him. But you, you may have right. been, quote unquote, in love with the dream of what you wanted. Yeah, I mean, it, it, and it certainly, I mean, because I was even, you know, I wasn't, you know, I was kind of repelled by him, like, especially mm -hmm. over time, I got repulsed by him. But he had this mm -hmm. bizarre narrative that somehow his gaining all this weight 
was intentional because I was supposed mm. to hate him. Like everything <laughs> that he did that was objectionable was part of these tests, right? So he basically had an excuse for being a slob. Everything he did that was annoying, all the stuff he did that drove me crazy and kept me exhausted. And, um, and then even, you know, the way he, you know, just like ate and just frankly got fatter and fatter and he and, yeah. and he made it you know he was like acted like he was doing it for me you know he's yeah, like i gotta walk around in this fat suit for you like i can't wow. wait till this is i can't wait till this is over and i get to you know have my abs back or wow which, yeah you know i was reading um yesterday the uh dear mr fox letter and yeah I'm going to link that in the show notes because I really want people to read it because first of all, it's, it's, it's such vulnerable, honest, painful writing. You know, I can't believe you wrote that in your notes app on yeah, your it's, iPhone. It, it's still there. I mean, I, I leave it there because I, I want to make sure people know that like I didn't craft that for public consumption. Yeah. I wrote that like in various chunks and bits and pieces while I was on the yeah. subway, like just yeah. having all those angry feelings and uh, and wanting yeah. to get them out. And I mean, I, I edited it just to make it smoother, but yeah. yeah, yeah, I wrote that on my phone. The thing about it, you know, you keep on reiterating, and I do understand this, you keep on reiterating why, like, why did you have to do this? Why was yeah. this necessary, you know? Um, which I think is what a lot of people feel when they come out of dealing with somebody who you know, could be a full blown, you know, psychopath. Do you still think about that? Do you still think about like why he had to do all these things to you? Um, I mean, I, not in the way that I did when I was writing that letter, I think. So, um, I mean, once you sort of understand that somebody, you know, that he's never gonna, he's never gonna care, right? I know that. So it's almost, it's easier to kind of let go of it when you understand that, you know, like I just like got caught up with a, a monster who doesn't yeah. care, never will, probably doesn't even understand what it, you know, he just doesn't care what he did. No. And um, and also, you know, he's gone on to, to kind of go invade other people's lives and-, and Oh, has he? Oh yeah. Doing that yeah. Rat. Wow. Yeah. Um, and so it makes it easier to kind of understand that you know, it what because I think the part that's so painful on the other side of these things is you feel like, what is it about me that you were okay with hurting? Like, why did you hurt mm. me? Like, what did I do? How could you hurt me like that? Mm. And that's what's initially so painful. And then mm -hmm. eventually you realize, okay, well, he would have hurt, he would and does and will hurt anybody and everybody. So it's not like, mm -hmm he was just hurting me, he would hurt anybody. Mm -hmm. I just happened anybody, to be, yeah. yeah. And also feeling like, you know, almost his gratification was taking me down and controlling mm -hmm. me and kind of, um, you know, that's what made him feel uh, mm -hmm. some sort of like rush of gratification, I would imagine, is kind of the control aspect of it. Um, you know, I mean, you gotta imagine the level of like insecurity that somebody has to feel that you need to dominate others to feel better. Like that you're so incapable of just having your own backbone and, and, and generating your own sense of self-esteem that you have to destroy other people to feel better. Yeah, there's there's an amazing Dan Shaw quote. Um, mm. I know you know who he is. Yeah, he's, mm. um, and I, I wrote it down somewhere. It's like a whole paragraph. Um, and I, I wrote it down and it kind of describes that in a really, really, um, kind of powerful way it describes that that kind of emptiness and wh and why they do that yeah um, yeah and, yeah I mean I, I I don't I don't fully understand his psychology I mean I feel like there's sort of this key difference between like the malignant narcissist and the sociopath in that yes. the malignant narcissist you know you could theoretically push their buttons and they have that like extreme sense of insecurity right mm -hmm. and then there's like the sociopath where they don't have the insecurity and the ego and the um you know whatever you want to call it like you can't manipulate them because they're just like they just don't mm -hmm. uh, they don't have mm -hmm. insecurities they don't have mm -hmm. hang-ups like mm -hmm. and so i don't 
I don't quite know where he lands um, because the thing about him kind of walking around in this giant, you know, getting bigger and bigger and, and the way he behaved, he very often really did seem like he just didn't care what anybody thought of him. Um, that's interesting. And that Do you think he thought like he was game. like a god? Yeah. Um, but well, that's another aspect that, you know, I, I sort of go back and forth on. I try not to spend too much time trying to figure out his psychology. Yeah, of but, course. But, of course. But yeah to the, you know i i do think about it as i'm editing my book draft and reading rereading the things that he wrote and said to me and and so many things where you know why did he make me do this why did he say this why did he mm -hmm. write this um and so to what extent did he really believe um mm -hmm. his own bullshit and and mm -hmm. like to what extent was there some delusion there um mm -hmm. but i mean the thing on the other side of this is <laughs> You know, I over time I started to remember, you know, kind of this narrative he spun about like his brother and this family and this and that. And more and more I realized like I'm not a big, I don't watch a ton of movies, particularly mm. like, you know, action movies because it's just overwhelming. But mm -hmm. more and more I realized, wait a minute, isn't this like the plot of Thor mm -hmm. with the brother Loki and like, oh my God, yep, yep. Yeah, and so, they're not very original. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then, yeah. and then, yeah, and I've, I've even since come across things that he said to me that are now sort of, I'm hearing them in the context of like, sort of spiritual teachings and whatnot, or yeah. this sort of, this conversations that people are having nowadays more and more about, you know, what is reality and like, and, and the sort yeah. of manifesting community and there's all these parallel realities and you just have to get on the vibration of the one yeah. that matches. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. I mean, that's very common nowadays. But sure. sometimes I'll hear somebody say something and it's precisely what he said. Like, it's precisely what he used as the excuse for when he took me away. And of course, you know, the tabloids and everybody incessantly repeats that I fled. We fled. Yeah. I ran away with all this stuff. No, I didn't. I was taken yeah. away and I don't have any, I didn't have any money at the time. Yeah. Um, but he gave me this whole narrative that it was like a like a parallel reality and we would just yeah go into that one and then come back into this one and hey i i can completely relate to believing that completely <laughs> um you wrote something i think it was in your your dear mr fox letter a paragraph that really stood out to me i'm going to read it real quick you know it very well um because because the thing is like he basically you know my understanding is basically cons you takes all your money and now you're on the hook to all the people that you were supposed to give that money to and he keeps mm -hmm. on convincing you to give the money to him and you go further and further you know into the this this dark well and people i think people sometimes go like well why did you just you know stop it but there's something you said you wrote so much of what i now owe is to good people people who thought they were helping me that believed in me now that's all on me along with the shame I have to carry all of this now alone. How do I explain that a big fat guy convinced me nothing is real? No one understands that. No one understands any of it. I don't understand most of it. You did this on purpose. Why? The, your whole letter is just so powerful. I, mean, I, just, I was just reading it and just I had the amount of pain I had feeling it because I could relate to so much of what you said. Yeah. Talk to me a bit about this thing of people not understanding what it's like in this in this unequal power dynamic that you were in. Yeah, I mean it, it's 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 painful because it's you know how how do I, I mean, it, it, years now it's been a few years I could explain it I think better than I could on, on the immediate other side of it, but you know people will say, and and this I think is was relevant in my criminal case because they just can't make sense of it. They're like, well, you know, you went to an Ivy League school, you you worked on Wall Street, you worked at one of the best, you know, private equity firms in the country. Like, how could you possibly be conned by this, you know, fat grifter? Like, how could you be, um, you know, how could you believe his bullshit? And, you know, they played up this whole thing about how he convinced me my dog would live forever, which, you know, again, was just one of those, like, things that he's always hinted at. But, um, you know, how could you believe his crazy lies mm -hmm. there? You know, it doesn't make sense to them. So therefore, the only thing that would make sense is that somehow I must have gotten something out of it and mm -hmm. or I was in love with, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. But um, um, 
you know, therein is the paradox of, yeah, mm. how are you? You know, I mean, as you mm -hmm. know, people who very often get into these situations, they tend to be very smart. Very. And, um, and very. I, this line that I heard of all places in a Joe Rogan podcast, but I was, uh, <laughs> he once said something about cults and people being basically saying that people who get into cults are stupid or how could you be mm. so stupid but then and therefore I was paying attention when he was having a conversation and actually then said the very opposite but mm -hmm. the person he was interviewing I think it was Michael Malice who said um, uh, who's this very funny guy and he said something about how um, well you can't uh, you can't train a dumb dog mm -mm. you know like you sure. have to be really smart to be kind of trainable yes. Um, so yes anyway and, and then, yeah, it was sort of conceded that, yes, smart people get pulled into cults. Um, yeah. I mean, I'll tell you that, that my first meetings with the prosecutors on our case, they were asking certain questions. Well, how did you not see this? How did you not? And I would say to them, you need to understand coercive control. I suggest you reach out to this expert. I suggest yeah. you reach out to that expert. You know, by the time we got to trial, they understood it very clearly, you know, yeah. but, but Which is they didn't understand it with you at all. No, and nor did they try. I mean, I, it, I mean, it was as as gratifying as it was to watch, you know, what happened with Keith, and to know where he is now. Um, it it it's there's also something painful about it because I just mm. feel like where was that? Yes. You know, I mean, I experience that a lot now. I mean, listening to certain po people being interviewed in podcasts and how they're treated, and um, yeah. you know, on the other side of Bad Vegan coming out. I was on defense yeah. and I was being yes. asked the tough questions and I was yes. having to defend myself and wasn't even, you know, properly equipped to do so. I want to, um, I want to get to that, but there's one thing I want to say before we get to bad vegan, by the way, the, even that title just pisses me off. Anyway, me too. We'll, <laughs> we'll get to that in a second. So Dr. Evan Stark, who I know as well. Yeah. So you wrote Dr. Evan Stark, who literally wrote the book on coercive control and indeed is credited with having coined that term. He did was mm -hmm. interviewed for the film. Um, the entire crew spent a full day at his home. Uh, I was told the footage was compelling, including one part where Dr. Stark says, quote, if I'd had had any involvement in her case, she never would have gone to jail. Correct. And, and that's the thing I think that people don't, they don't understand what coercive control is. They, and I get this question, you've gotten this question a lot, you know, they just keep on asking, well, how could you have been so stupid? How could you have been so this? And I say, do you know that, that there are Harvard graduates that still believe in Keith Raniere? Yeah. Harvard fucking graduates that still yep. believe in Keith Raniere. And the fact is that cult leaders and scammers and con men and women, I suppose they're, they're, they're women as well. They look for targets that are useful, you know? Exactly. They don't look for somebody, a bum on the street. They want somebody who's intelligent, you know, who's, who's got, you know, sway, who's attractive, who's whatever it is, you know. Um, they don't seem to, to get that. I mean, how do, you, how do you now handle that kind of shit? And then, we, and then I want to get to Bad Vegan. Um, I mean, well, now it's just easier for me to say, like, I mean, it depends on who I'm talking to, but just to be like, well, no, you don't understand. I mean, exactly what you said. Like, look, there's all these other examples of people who are highly intelligent who you know were in cults and whatnot it's almost like mm -hmm. you need to be a, a rather intelligent person to be mm -hmm. to be pulled into it these are the targets mm -hmm. um and not just intelligent but you know sort of a, an idealist and you believe in the best mm -hmm. and you're um mm -hmm. you know and you're a hard worker and you're persistent yes. and you don't give up easily and you're tenacious and you um you know and you're very loyal and you know, yes. when you commit to something, you're all in. And so they take these really good qualities and, mm -hmm. uh, you mm -hmm. know, weaponize them for themselves. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it, it's it's definitely over time. I sort of passed this threshold. It was very striking on Christmas Day of all this one woman, a young, very young woman wrote these like horrendous comments on my social media and like nothing I'm not used to seeing. Um, but certainly it died down. It's been two year, almost two years now since um, Bad Vegan came out. So, uh, but it was just sort of striking because it was Christmas Day. And mm. she kind of was commenting on like a bunch of my posts, like one after the other. And I just saw them in my, in my comments feed. Mm. And, um, and my first thought was that I felt so, I, I sort of, my first thought was like, 
feeling bad for her. Like, what is it in my story that triggered her? Mm. And I almost felt bad, like, oh, God, that poor mm. girl, you know? And all of a sudden, I realized what a turning point that was where the comments didn't trigger me to get angry and upset and sort of feel bad about myself. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's a function of being used to it, but I think mm -hmm. it's having done a lot of work on the shame aspect of it yes. and kind of really getting solid with myself where it's yeah. like, you know what? Other people can try to tell me I should be ashamed of myself and I should be rotting yeah. in jail and all those things. Yeah. But I've gotten to the point where, you know, I, I feel like, you know, everything I've felt shame over has been the work of other people. Yes. And I might be, you know, I, I, I'm, i you know, I'd be insecure about all kinds of things about myself, right? Loads of insecurities, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but but I'm a good person. Like I mm -hmm. know that mm -hmm. I'm a really mm -hmm. good person. Yeah. So why, why am I feeling shame? You know, yeah, yes, these things happened, I'm responsible, but yeah. why am I feeling such shame? And so getting to the place where I feel like, uh, you know, at least I'm I'm clear with myself on that. Those yeah. comments now don't bother me as much. They they still piss. I, I I get more mad at the director of Bad Vegan than I do at anybody when these yeah. when I get these comments. Yeah, yeah. But but at least they're not making me feel um, bad right. myself. Well, let's get to Bad Vegan because I you know yeah. <clears throat> I have a number of friends. Of course, Sarah Sarah Edmondson being one of them. Yeah. You know who saw you as as a hero and you know loved your restaurant and I I know other people you know, who looked at what you created and thought, oh, my God, I'd love to create what she, cre what she created. And, like, they look at you like a hero. And so when Bad Vegan came out, you know, my friends were like, that's bullshit. That's bullshit, you know. And so then I found out that, you know, they had done some very deceptive things. So I guess the question, simple question is, you know, what did, you know, what did Bad Vegan get right and what did they get wrong, the TV show? Um, I think that uh, I'm glad you called it a TV show. <laughs> Because yes. I wrote yes. this, right? I wrote that whole thing, which I know, you yes. know, the that Bad Vegan is not a documentary. Um, you know, well, I think they, at least in the beginning, what they got right was they really sort of did a good job, I think, depec depicting that it was a really special place, right? And of course, that's, mm. you know, you want to make what was destroyed be that much more tragic, but they, they did, you know, sort of accurately convey that the people who worked there really loved it. Um, you know, even when you just said right now, referred to me as cr the creator, I don't even feel that way. I just feel like I'm really good at kind of recognizing and cultivating the talent. And they're mm -hmm. the ones who deserve the credit for, mm -hmm. you know, like the, the food and all of the things. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. um, but either way, you know, and, and the lot in the early part was sort of somewhat accurate. I mean, there was some stuff they left out that I thought they shouldn't have, but I understand now why they did. Because I, I went through a related situation before with somebody who got a large amount of money out of me. Um, and uh, and it has gone on to, you know, get large amounts of money out of people over and over and over again for years and years and years. Um, so I'd kind of been through it before. And I think originally they had highlighted that more but mm -hmm. then took it out and watching it more carefully now, I see that um, the, the, way that, the way that that show was done is, you know, you walk into it and you either might relate because you've been manipulated yourself. And for those people, it was really valuable because for them to see like, oh, it happened to somebody else too, or yeah. it gave them better understanding about what happened to themselves or, they again at the very least they feel less alone yes. and i've heard from you know i don't i mean just tons and tons of people mostly women some men mm -hmm. who just say mm -hmm. that they've been through something similar sometimes mm -hmm. eerily similar mm -hmm. um and just you know are shamed their family doesn't understand they're broken they never recovered their life how are they you know so seeing this is is useful um and in some cases the most gratifying thing is if somebody says it's like it was like the like they watched it and it was the thing that got them to realize oh my god this is what's happening to me and then they got out of something that's amazing yeah. so like for that reason i'm i'm glad it's out there like i wouldn't want them to take it off the air because i think yeah. if it's going to help anybody get out of a situation or you know help somebody's family understand yeah. um because i find that so painful it's been painful yeah. for me but it's painful for people when they're isolated on even on the other side of it because people don't yeah understand so that that i mean at least 
there's something good there. Um, yeah. yeah. But but then yeah, but but then there was a lot that was, you know, now I can see how it was sort of crafted in a way that he sort of left out a lot of things that would have backed me up, and he left out a lot of things that would have kind of pushed you to the side of going, okay, well, clearly she wasn't in on it. Clearly she could never have done this on purpose or mm. gotten anything out of it because she was miserable. And, she, mm -hmm. you know, there were all these sort of things that would have been, would have led everybody to, you know, the conclusion that like I was grossly manipulated and this was my yeah. biggest nightmare come true. Let, but, led, led them to the truth. The exactly. Truth. Yeah. So, but instead, you know, he kind of crafted this thing that if you come into it and you're skeptical, you're going to find, you're going to latch on to those things that make me look sketchy, you know? So mm -hmm. even little things where he'd ask me a question and, um, and, and I say, you know, I sort of pause and I'm like, well, I don't, I don't remember because mm. by, you know, anybody in this situation, there's tons of stuff you don't remember. That's, tons. that's like, it would be weird if I did remember it, right? Mm -hmm. But things like like there's so so those are the more subtle things where it just kind of makes me look suspect, like I'm lying. Mm -hmm. um, but then there were much more blatant things too. And then um, the very worst part was uh, this phone call at the end. Um, but you know things he left out. So if you read Dear Mr. Fox, I'm mm -hmm. I get pretty graphic in there yes. <laughs> about yeah. what he what he did to me. And I yeah. I you know it was the end of a like 12 hour a day of interviewing and and he got to that part of asking me about that and I spoke about it in the interview and I'm, I was crying and mm -hmm. um, another producer told me that you know that part had been so compelling and so mm -hmm. I was shocked that he had cut it out of the of the show explain um, to the audience that that last phone call and just how what that yeah. did to you and what was wrong about it yeah well what's interesting is I also learned something else just within the last two weeks that I didn't even know until two weeks ago or less than two weeks ago. And mm. I'll explain to you what that is. So um, on my website, I wrote this whole thing, Bad Vegan is Not a Documentary. And, you know, it's long and I go into great detail because I just felt like I'm going to answer all the questions with all the footnotes so that it's all there. And yeah. I didn't change, I wrote that, put it up, I haven't changed it. Now I could add like a ginormous, you know, it's worse. <laughs> Um, yeah. But the call at the end was out of was completely out of context, and presented and basically it was a it was a clip of an audio call uh, where I'm speaking to him, and so the problem is that like to explain it is a long explanation. If you think back to the beginning of the so the way the film opens is they show me uh, there's like a camera on me, and I'm talking to him and the audio is being recorded, mm. so. If you at least remember the beginning of the film, you'd be like, okay, well, she recorded him on purpose. And I even say, so they show me recording him and mm. they show, they, they air the audio, audio of him. And then they show me right after I get off the phone with him and I'm drinking a beer because I was so nervous, just, mm. you know, so nervous talking to him on camera. And, um, and I say, um, you know, I would never record somebody without their knowing but that fucker, like, fuck him, right? Basically, mm -hmm. I'm, it's just my way of, even in mm -hmm. a tiny way, getting back at him. Mm -hmm. um, but then, you know, people wonder, like, well, wait, why were you talking to him at all? Like, why why mm -hmm. could you pick up the phone and call him? So that's after, a whole... After everything that we've just seen. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah. Um, that's a whole other explanation, which they didn't include in Bad Vegan. Um, and so I kind of had to put that in my essay of, why yeah. I was talking to him in the first place had to do with Leon's safety also has to do with like you know just making that conscious decision that I'm safer certainly Leon was safer because I knew he was getting out of jail before I was going in and my I mean I was absolutely gripped with terror that he was going to go while I'm locked up that he was going to go um you know take Leon from my my mm -hmm. mother's house where mm -hmm. it was sort of inevitable that Leon would be staying with my mom yeah um and so when he got out, basically I saw what he was writing on Twitter. I could, anyway, I, I got in touch with him, which was, there's like, that's a whole separate conversation, which, mm -hmm. you know, I'm happy to have. But, um, you know, I was so relieved because it was like, okay, he's not going to hurt Leon. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to like suspend. I'm good at this now. Like I've, I've dissociated before and now I kind of 
I'm used to feeling that way. So I could kind of like put my brain in a place where I could have a conversation with him and not like freak out over everything yeah. he'd done. Yeah. And also by that time knowing like, okay, this is clearly somebody that doesn't care. No. Um, and I think by then I'd probably written that whole Mr. Fox letter because it was a whole year past. Yeah. Um, and so I knew he wasn't going to care. Um, and I knew that I'm safer if he kind of thinks that he might still, you know, have a have mm -hmm. a bit of a hold on me or that one mm -hmm. day he could get a hold on me again. So mm -hmm. it's not that I played along with him like I believed his bullshit. Yeah. But I just like kept this line of communication with him. But then, yeah. And then at the end of Bad Vegan, they air like another clip of a call. Which which that's the I think that was when I heard about that. And basically, I'm going to try and explain it. Tell me if yeah. I'm correct. They made it seem as though you were still connected with him and you were in on the whole thing is what it seemed like. Yes. Now, now, not everybody's going to conclude that, right? So if you watch the film and you've been manipulated and you're pretty sympathetic to me, then you're just kind of confused by the call. I think mm. at best, people were like mm. confused by the call. Um, or even if they think that, you know, I was manipulated and how horrible this whole thing was, it was disturbing for people who, you know, I know how it feels to watch other people's stories. So like, I know, how, you know, I just like twisted up in my gut, I felt watching um, The Puppet Master or mm. Stolen Youth and these other stories. Like I know how painful it is to watch them. Yeah. And so yeah. imagine at the end of it to hear something that feels manipulative where you're going, wait, she's still in touch with him? Yeah. You know, it's like, what, why? Yeah. And then, you know, yeah. and they might realize, okay, well that, that they must have done something weird there because at the beginning, you know, so people yeah. kind of have to figure out that like, okay, but either way to the people who are understanding what happened, it makes absolutely no sense. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, but then to the people who are kind of confused by what's going on or they're skeptical or they don't really get it because in, in Bad Vegan, there was zero explanation of like, how does this happen? So they didn't use mm -hmm. any of Evan Stark. They didn't use any, there was no person explaining. They yeah. spent a whole day interviewing Hoyt Richards, who mm. you probably know who he is. I Amazing do, yeah. guy, super articulate, great, lovely person, totally understands what happened to me as I understand what happened to him. Didn't mm -hmm. use any of it. So there's mm -hmm. nobody explaining how this happens. Mm -hmm. um, it was just like, look at this crazy story um yeah and so yeah. so but so even worse okay so it's not it's bad enough that they aired this little bit of a phone call which you know i was playing a role and i agreed to do these calls and i was just trying to get him i was tr keeping him on the phone and trying to get him to say as much as i could get him to say right because right. he did say a lot of looney tunes things right um but they grabbed these little bits and what confused me is I, what I said on the, what I said in that clip, I was like, that's, that's weird. That just, just like sounds off to me. Didn't even occur to me. And I think I just, I watched it once. I was like, you know, overwhelmed, felt mm. like traumatized by the whole thing. Didn't even mm. watch it again until a year and a half later. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't realize until not that long ago but not only was that call out of place and clearly there to, to you know, create a false impression, but the audio itself wasn't what I said. Mm -hmm. What I actually say in that clip is the opposite, is basically it's like he used a piece of one part of the conversation and Mr. Fox says something and then I reply, but what they have me replying is the opposite of the way that I actually replied. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm, mm, and mm. it didn't even like when I found that out, I was like, oh, my God, I can't even believe I didn't think to check the original audio. Mm -hmm. And like, no wonder what I said made no sense, because I just thought, was mm -hmm. I being super sarcastic? Um, and now I realize, too, why so many women are are really brutal to me in comments, because what what happens is we're, we're talking on the phone. It's this, you know, again, audio that I made full well, knowing I was going to give it all to the to the filmmakers. And he says, um, he says something to me like, um, you know, you're still the most beautiful woman in the world, or you're still the most beautiful girl in the world. And you're the smartest person I've ever met. Right? In reality, I basically made a joke and said, 
but I didn't solve that wooden puzzle. Meaning like, I'm not, how could I be that smart? I didn't solve that stupid wooden puzzle you gave me. Cause of course, you know, those like stupid tests you'd give me. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what, that was my response, right? Mm -hmm. But what they air is instead, he says, you're, you know, you're the most beautiful girl in the world and you're the smartest person I've ever met. And in bad vegan, and the response is, you know, it pisses me off cause you're fucking right. Hmm. I would never say that. So it makes mm -hmm. it seem like I'm, mm -hmm. so it kind of paints this picture like we got away with something mm -hmm. and like, mm -hmm. you know, I only got, mm -hmm. I only got four months and here we are on the other side of it. Cause they air like this, they put the, the little caption saying that this was so many months after she was out of jail. Hmm. So it's like on the other side of the whole thing, I'm agreeing with him that, I, you know, mm. when I'm not. And the mm. funny thing is where they took that clip from, it pisses me off because you're fucking right. I said that in response to him saying something that was making fun of me. Mm. So it was completely the opposite. And I, I mean, I've never, I haven't even said this out loud to anybody. I only just found that out. And mm. I wish I'd known in the beginning because I would have, I, I mean, I, I wish I'd known, I wish I'd figured mm -hmm. that out earlier earlier on because i it did you know it didn't even occur to me that they would do that yeah you know yeah. so it's like it didn't occur to me even though they did splice my interview earlier in the film too in a way that kind of made me look bad yeah. but it was a little bit like you know it wasn't quite it altered what i was saying and but it wasn't quite that that bad and so i just feel like there's no i i just want to i wish i could ask him you know i want the director i want to go dude Tell me why you did that. Explain yeah. it. I just want to know. Explain yeah. it. What was? What were you doing there as a as a director? Yeah, you know. And like, and how dare you? <laughs> yes, of course, of course. Look, I, and and I, and I think I've mentioned you. I've also been the subject of just you know, various shows that just flat out fucking lied, used footage completely out of context. Yep. Uh, not the vow. Uh, I'm 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 pretty happy with the vow, but um, you know, just thinking about filmmaking in general. You know, you may have seen this, and I think the audience has seen this. You know, you watch a TV show; it's got a, it's a, it's an ongoing series, and the and the characters going in a certain direction. And suddenly, they switch and they change their mind, right? And then they switch and they change their mind, and then you're like, "What the fuck is wrong with this person?" And 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 it's not that there's anything. What, what's going on is that the writers are told every ten minutes, just fuck with the audience, right? And fuck with them this way, and then fuck with them that way, and that's why what's going on is like filmmakers are being told. Maybe by the streamers, you know, maybe by the financiers, you know, you got to make it more interesting, you got to make it more sexy. And so let's fuck with the audience. And, and I think what happens is it's a little bit to me like people that, that fly drones from the Nevada desert and just wipe people out. Like they have no idea that this thing that they're enjoying right. has a consequence. Right. Like it hurts an actual person. And I think what happens is, you know, how the audience. Just let me rant for a second. Yeah. <laughs> you know how the audience thinks that the person they're seeing on the TV screen is a character, not a real person? Yeah. I think what happens with filmmakers sometimes, not all filmmakers, please understand, I'm a filmmaker, so I'm not, you know, I'm not yeah. saying all filmmakers. Um, they get so caught up in a character that they forget that they're dealing with a subject with, with, with feelings and pain in the middle of trauma still, like massive amounts of trauma, right? massive amounts of dissociation. And because they've come out of an abusive situation where they may have been, they may have frozen, they may have been fawning, you need to be careful what you ask subjects to do because they might still be in a fawn response and you have to make sure that they really are okay with can we talk about this, can we talk about that? Because if they're fresh out of the abusive relationship, they feel they have to. Yeah, I, and I, that's that's totally me too. It's like, I just, I'm that person that like never wants to be rude. I wanna be helpful, I wanna be accommodating. And I naively thought that, you know, this is a documentary. He is a reputable, hmm. a, a, you know, filmmaker. Like, surely they're not gonna misrepresent the truth. And I, part of the reason, or the main reason, the only reason I put that Mr. Fo Dear Mr. Fox letter up there, um, which I didn't intend to kind of publish, uh, or at least maybe not until I wrote my book or, or whatnot, but um, was because I, that was the first thing that he read about my story. Mm. And, um, and, and, and everything in there is, you know, 
pretty probably everything I wrote in there was is kind of verified in one way or another via, mm -hmm. you know. So it's not like I I made that up, you know. Yeah. So yeah, knowing that you know, it's like if you read that Dear Mr. Fox letter and then watch Bad Vegan and go, oh, like why? Mm. Um, mm. And you know, in in this case, the director has no excuse to be, be as being under pressure by financiers or the or the platform because mm. they made it. Um, he and his producing partner made it themselves, paid for it themselves, um, because mm. they both had the money to do so. And then once it was complete, then sold it to the platforms and ended mm. up selling it to Netflix I for see. a shitload of money. I see. Right. And the and and then also like super damaging was they they I was under the impression that at the end of the film they were gonna um, put include a note that early on for my participation for my participation I'd been paid an amount that then went to cover what all of my employees were owed because right. um, of the money that they lost after I disappeared. Yes. And you know again that would have if had they included that as I believed that they were going to. Yeah. Um, you know, then then people again would be it would be harder to yell at me and think that I was in on the yeah, whole thing. Yeah, you, you if, were not you were not paid for your participation in the in the, in the film at all. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I I what I wanted in order to participate was I was like I need to pay yes. what the employees are owed, even though it was yes. a small fraction of the total debt, like a small fraction of the total yes. amount that I that I owe. I yeah. just wanted that paid for, and so yeah. that was done. But beyond that, I didn't make money. Meanwhile, they made enough. They could have paid off all my debt if they wanted to and still had some left over so i hear you I like hear you. It, it's it's you know it's mm -hmm. and um yeah and i know enough about the process that i um i'm reasonably sure that it wasn't the it wasn't like it was netflix that pressured them to change mm -hmm. the ending and mm -hmm. make it more controversial i think that's he designed it that way himself and i think you know it 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 had the effect of people arguing about it Right. Sort of affect mm. you like, you know, people around the water cooler who watched it, you know, now they're standing around the water cooler at work arguing. Yeah. You know, some people are saying, oh, my God, that poor woman. Other people are saying, oh, my God, she was totally in on it. And and it's not like, you know, I have friends of friends and friends of mine who would send me screenshots of their friends, you know, intelligent people who would yeah. say, dude, she was totally in on it. You know, no, I know. It, I mean, I. I got the same um, kind of shit as well. People saying stuff, and I go, I go, Jesus, do you not know how filmmaking works? Yeah. Do you not? What the fuck is wrong with you people? Yeah, and and and, and on top of that is being told by so many people in my life and people that wanted to kind of work with me in this ne next chapter of my life, telling me that like, no, no, nobody thought you were in on it. No, you didn't look bad at all. No, you looked fine. Like telling me that like it wasn't a big deal yeah no what they did was you know like, really yeah. and then you know anyway i want to talk about something that the the forever pups thing the oh the, yeah the ad campaign which which to me i don't know to me it was very cruel um but can you just can you just talk a bit about what Mr. Fox, you know, told you about Leon and that whole story he spun and then and then what happened with the marketing campaign? Well, th there was this narrative that, um, you know, he had made me believe my dog would live forever. And and that kind of stems from there was this article written about what happened uh, in Vanity Fair. And and that article even played up, you know, he made her believe her dog would live forever. So that kind of continued to be one of those things that was like repeated in the tabloids, along with like our being arrested because of a pizza, which I didn't even know existed. So I had nothing to do with it. But um, never mind. The tabloids didn't care. They kept kind of running with that. But um, so and I think that, you know, I had written a blog and actually I, I reposted it on my current website about the story of when I adopted Leon. And it was one of those things where the way that it happened, it felt like it was a force beyond me. Like I had, I had no intention of adopting a dog. The way that it happened just felt like I had to go get him, right? Mm. And then, you know, according to how old he was, his, you know, he was about five months old and uh, doing the math, that would have been right when my cat died, that I'd had a 
was very connected to. So I had just written this post about, you know, the experience of adopting him. And I included those things and not that I believed anything because of it, but just the way that it felt. And so I think Mr. Fox sort of ran with that and made it seem like, you know, he sent Leon to me and Mm -hmm. like he was responsible for putting Leon and me together and that like we could still, you know, he, he never outright said, you know, I'll make Leon live forever, but it was just the repeated implication and, um, you know, kind of in the context of everything he made me believe. And so um, Netflix did this really bizarre um, marketing campaign that, um, that was like this fake company called Perpetual Pups that would pop up. And the way that I saw it was, it popped up on my Twitter feed as like a promoted post from a what appeared to be a company or a brand called Perpetual Pup. So you click on it and there's like this one minute video. Yeah. Um, and and then at the end of the video, it pops up and says, you know, bad vegan and it links to the to the trailer. So yeah. and in it, it's make it's basically you realize it's a spoof. Yeah. And, and it's not like it's not even funny. Like if there was some, if they had done something that was actually really clever and smart, I would have at least had some respect for like the smartness and cleverness of it, but it wasn't even that. And it was just offensive. It was offensive on behalf of like everybody who, you know, genuinely wants their dog to live forever. I don't know. It just, it was offensive because it sort of plays on people's, you know, people's attachment to their animals. And then also it was just offensive on behalf of like everybody that this has ever happened to like yeah you know make it making a, a sort of joke out of it it was just <sighs> gross it was i think you know i'm not going to put it i'm not going to actually play it in the podcast because i'm sure i'll get um, some kind of cease and desist if i yeah. do that so i'm going to link it in the show notes but i think the thing that got me about it because i watched it this morning before i spoke to you again was you know you watch this thing about the the you know your dog can live forever and then you start to realize oh it's a spoof and then you realize oh this is so fucking delusional and then when they cut to you at the end what happens is that thought of delusion continues oh so she's delusional right you know as opposed to no she was somebody that was under the the sway of a con man and a course of controller who got seriously head fucked right and and that that's consistent with the like the billboards. So there are billboards in L.A. Um, yeah. of of my face, and where they took a, an existing photograph and like sort of painted over it, and weirdly like made my eyes blue. But they painted over it, and then mm-hmm. in the actual photograph, I'm eating a salad, and they made it mm-hmm. instead of a salad, it was like cash. Yeah. So I'm like, uh, what is that gonna? And, and so it didn't even. I mean, these things just didn't even hit me right away. But I mean, there's tons of people, as you know, who like saw the billboards. Yeah. Maybe they, they see the ad pop up on their Netflix now alongside Bad, Bad Surgeon, you know, who is yeah. actually a sociopath. And yeah. so you see those images, Bad Vegan. What are you going to assume? You're going to assume that I'm like a sociopathic con artist. And I've yeah. been treated that way. Like I'm another, you know, Anna Delvey. I'm another con artist. Yeah. And, you know, it has massive implications forget how i feel it's like yeah you know i'm trying to rebuild my business i have this amazing like i i could bring back everything i had before and then some yeah and into into an environment that's like even more primed for it and i do have an enormous amount of support behind me but yet there's still you know kind of everything i've tried to do over the last number of years i met with that that you know like you know, like, oh, you're, you're the bad vegan, like, and Mm -hmm. then I know what they're assuming. Um, Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I mean, that's, there's no way to sort of be hard to kind of quantify that. And and part of the weirdness of it is that I, I usually don't know. So I don't know, like, if I am interacting with somebody, and they sort of realize that I'm the person that's in those billboards, and I'm the person that's that was depicted in this show that maybe they mm. saw or they didn't see. I don't know what they're thinking. Yeah. So it's like, I just have like all these sort of awkward interactions where then yeah. I, and you know, I have to be defensive and explain, um, or not even know if I need to explain because I don't know. So it's just, it's, yeah. it's, 
it's uh, you know it's it amazes me the irony because if i look at the world right now and i'm not going to get into particular name calling but i look at the world right now there are massive criminals running countries and corporations mm-hmm. right horrible human beings doing terrible things but depending on where the i guess the the, the legacy media says where you should look they're focused on you as opposed to people in powerful positions who've done, you know, absolutely horrendous things. It's just, right. so, it's just so fascinating to me. I think we spoke in the last conversation you and I had. Did we speak about Nightcrawler, that movie Nightcrawler? Yes, yes. Oh, my God. Did, I, I forgot. Did I, you see it? No, I haven't seen it. Oh. I don't, I'm, I'm so, I don't watch stuff, especially if it's no, going to be no, I understand. kind of but, creepy. But, but, but. but what's so interesting, that, you know, that this, you know J- Jake Gyllenhaal, who's trying to be uh, one of these cameramen who, you know, captures great stuff, you know, like yeah. deaths and crashes and everything. And the film just gets darker and darker because the TV station realizes he's getting great stuff and starts to go along with him. I think That's, it's Rene Russo. Yeah. Go, goes along with him like, yeah, get the stuff, get that stuff. And he ends up like um, allowing somebody to, 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 to die on camera so that he can capture it. And I, and I think to myself, it's an interesting metaphor for this, this kind of animal that uh, media has become. Yeah. And, and then I also go to myself, we need to make sure that we don't just say, well, it's just media, because media is made up of people. Yep. It's people making these decision, decisions every day and, and making decisions that are very, very painful. And so just to go back to what I said at the beginning, I haven't been able to watch, watch uh, you know, Bad Vegan because I'm so angry at, at what happened to you. You know, just so yeah. pissed off. Yeah, and, and I mean, I, 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 you know, I would be so curious to to actually have conversations with everybody involved. Mm. You know, like the people who made that perpetual pups thing, the mm. the marketing people at Netflix, and Chris, the director, and mm-hmm. and his producing partner, and say like, you know, I mean, he knew precisely what he was doing, but I think he sort of weirdly potentially manipulated others to not realize mm. quite what he was doing. I'm not sure. I have all my theories there, but, but yeah. you know, to kind of, I mean, I know it's generally useless and this would never actually happen, but I would be really curious. Like, why, why wouldn't you talk about it? Why wouldn't you answer my questions? Why wouldn't you, you, you mm. made lots of money. You, you, you know, like it, mm. it's out there. It was, it was watched by a bajillion people. Like, mm-hmm. why wouldn't you sit on a stage and answer these questions? Why not? And and then and, yeah. and then the idea that like I almost got roped into doing like another version of this, which mm. was kind of what happened to me more recently, where um, uh, you know, people that that I was potentially gonna gonna work with going forward like wanted me to to kind of agree to sign up to do a second one, mm. where again it would likely end up with Netflix and. You know, mm. they tried to say, no, no, it would be fine. We wouldn't make you look bad. And it's like, <laughs> I'm supposed to believe you. And and also, yeah. no, I mean, what what would that look like if I agreed to kind of do something and go back on Netflix where. Right, right. Where they where they already did what they did before, like that basically I would be endorsing. Yeah. What they did if I went back again. Yeah, you know, I think sometimes I'm sad to say this, but I think sometimes the decision making process that happens with, you know, media creators is very simple and kind of blase. It's as simple sometimes as, yeah, but it's cool. Yeah. Like cool is the morality. It's not about good or bad or causing damage. It's just cool. Like if it's cool, that's good, you know, because yeah. cool leads to money. Yeah, I I re-listened to your podcast about um, I think the weaponization of filmmaking and mm, mm. Um, and how you know people tend to think like they tend to dress up as the Darth Vader characters because they're cool and yeah and what that says and then it's funny because you said there was like this line in there where I was sure you were talking about Bad Vegan and I mm. re-listened to it and you said um, you you said that like it's as if the director the filmmakers are saying we need to destroy the way the public sees this woman. We don't care what effects it has on her life or the bullying she'll endure and the public mm. won't question it. And mm. I, I, when you said that, I was like, oh, he's talking about bad vegan. He must have, mm. you know, and, <laughs> but that's, that's kind of precisely what, um, what happened. And yeah, I think there, there is some, 
some sort of mindset that um, potentially some people would would kind of maybe listen to this or or step mm. back from it and go, oh, yeah, that actually fuck this really, you know, yeah, this, this isn't this. I can't believe what we're doing to people. But then there's yeah. the, then there are those that, um, you know, they know what they're doing and, and don't care. Yeah, they do. They absolutely do. I've I've been in uh, I've been in Hollywood long enough to say that there's there's people that man, there's a fair amount of evil there, you know. Yeah, it just it's like you know don't call it. I really, really, really feel like you know I I kind of want to write a whole other thing, but like I'm serious. There needs to be a new category called docutainment. Mm. Yes. Just don't call yes. it a documentary. And I mean, yes. I just naively thought like, okay, this is a documentary, documentaries. And that's why people don't get paid. You know, that's mm -hmm. why they didn't pay me for my time or how much, I mean, I, mm -hmm. an enormous amount of time, like all the materials I gave them, all yeah. the stuff. And then everybody else they interviewed, you know, they, they take up other people's time and, you know, Evan Stark's time for an entire day. They, they use up all these other people's time don't yeah. pay anybody and then yeah. they make a bajillion dollars from it but that's not yeah. how documentaries were in the past and there's an expectation that it's going to be truthful which is kind yes. of you know it's supposed to you're not they're not supposed to pay people to preserve the integrity of it the yes. journalistic integrity of it and in fact yes. i mean i wish i'd recorded these zooms i did have some interaction with netflix uh with their marketing people before it came out um mm. and once I saw it, they knew I was going to be pissed. So, but, but I was begging them because I wanted to watch it earlier and they wouldn't let me watch it until kind of mm. right up to before it aired. And I was begging them to let me watch it. I even cried and, and they used the excuse of like journalistic integrity that mm. why they wouldn't let me mm. watch it. Mm. So, mm. um, yeah, I really oh, feel like man. there, there needs to be a change. Like don't call it docu don't call it a documentary. It shouldn't, can't be in that category. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm with you. You know, I and I, and I have to say, it just it sucks. I have to say this, but like, just you know, for legal purposes, like I don't know any of the people that were involved in your show. I don't know yeah. the director. I'm not actually commenting on them specifically, but I'm talking about the things that that I've been through, and the the damage that I saw that happened to you. Legal disclaimers. Good God. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about where you're at now because mm -hmm. there's a whole bunch of things you're doing now. There's a kind of resurrection you're going through. And, and I also want to understand before you get there, like how have you, how have you survived this? How have you fought your way back to wanting to build your life again in such mm -hmm. a big way? Um, I mean, as I'm sure you know, it's, you know, it's very much what choice do you have? You know, it's, there's that thing that when, when you're sort of, when people say, oh, you're so strong for getting through everything you did, which I appreciate, um, but also like, well, what, what choice did I have? Um, I mean, I, I've just, you know, like if there's a chance that I can bring my company back and, and rebuild what was lost and, and also kind of restore what other people lost, um, then I have to keep going and, and do that. Um, and of course, also on the other side of this, I want to, I want to help other people who've been through it. So I've written a memoir draft that's incredibly long and it's taking me forever to edit it. And even the process of doing that was as painful as it has been, um, incredibly useful in terms of processing what happened so that like once I'm done with all the editing and I eventually get it out there, like it's out there, you know, I don't, I'm not going to go back and rummage through the details of the story necessarily. Um, I am working on another, uh, an actual documentary, um, which is, you know, very, very different than the arrangement with Bad Vegan. And, um, and I'm hoping that's going to be really useful also in explaining how it happened. Uh, which I think is the most fascinating part of these stories and yes. is very often completely left out, you know, is, is the psychology behind what's going on and how it happens, which is actually what's going to help people um, yes. and be, you know, fascinating and interesting. Um, and, you know, I sort of, 
I moved back. To, I was I was brought back to New York to reopen my restaurant in the very same location, and then um, it sort of came apart. Um, the, when it finally came apart, it was basically because I was told if I don't sign up to do this film, there's no restaurant, mm. and I'm out. And it was like, you know. I don't know. That was devastating, like absolutely mm. devastating. And and yet again, I just sort of feel like, you know, I, there'd been people in my orbit who were like, they don't have your best interest in mind because they brought me here, promised me a salary, didn't pay me a dime. Yeah, things were delayed, but there was no, no communication. They didn't tell me what was going on. Like, I'm confused. I don't know what's going on. And then like to to come at me with that, like either you do this or there's no restaurant. And mm. to say no restaurant, it's like, this is the location where I had that place for over 10 years and that, you know, I like nearly killed myself to get it reopened. Cause there's this whole thing where it closed and then I got it reopened and I raised all this money mm -hmm. to reopen it. And so I raised all this money from investors, put it back into the restaurant to get it reopened. And then mm. he, even after that, he took me away again and it closed. Mm. Mm. So it was like, I went through this dark hell of effort to get that place reopened. And it's just, it's so incredibly meaningful. And to have somebody say to me like, well, I'm just gonna open something else there and you're out. Like, if, if you don't sign up and do this thing, mm. like, what am I gonna do? So, mm -hmm. um, you know, but he'd also said, if you wanna buy me out of the lease, you can. So I, I have some people who would want to invest and I know there's more mm -hmm. people that would. And it's just something that, um, you know, I'm trying to put together, but it's a lot, especially when you're coming from a place of having been exhausted again you know, like gone through this past yeah. year has been exhausting of not knowing what's going on, you know, not getting paid, not knowing how I'm going to like afford anything and, yeah. and, and yet not knowing the timing of it. So I don't even know like if I'm about to get paid or if this is going to happen or if this is going to, and just being in this, like, as you probably know, it's like, for me, I'm so, uh, I avoid anything that's like, like say somebody was like, hey, you wanna go bungee jumping? No, 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 no I don't wanna yeah. be scared because just yes. the feeling of being scared feels traumatizing in a way that's yes. beyond, like I, that's why I don't wanna watch a scary movie. I don't wanna yes. listen. I don't wanna be scared because just that very feeling of being scared feels like I'm going back there, Yes. you know? So that's why this the whole year of like uncertainty and the anxiety of like, you know, Oh, and now I can't pay my rent. Now what am I going to do? And then the shame mm. of like, well, I can't be that person that doesn't pay their bills because that's just mm. going to be a whole, of you know, tsunami of shame on me. So I got to figure of this course. out. Yeah. And uh, so this it's been exhausting, but yeah, um, you know, but I'm I'm really encouraged by all the people that are you know like the Instagram people and all the people who are rooting for it to come back yeah. and um yeah. and i just think that that place is so special it's like got some seriously good juju there that um i feel like it's gotta it's gotta come back and yeah. one way or another it really it just needs to happen and all the you know i mean i'm in touch with the vast majority of the people that used to work there mm. all the ones that were um you know were in bad vegan yeah. um and you know a lot of the key key people that work there and they're all like you know amped up for it to come back and even the ones really that like have amazing. new lives and they have kids and they live somewhere else they want to come help it you know they want to come help it get reopened a lot of people mm -hmm. want to come back and um and it's like mm -hmm. how can that not happen and yeah. not just for me it's not for me and also because i'll you know it would be like a vehicle to then help you know restore what was lost by um prior investors but i just feel like it's so incredibly meaningful for all those mostly women, some men who reached out to me, all those people that have reached out to me and I feel their pain when they tell me their stories, like, you know, in a yes. long DM yes. for them to see that, you know, all that horror happened. I got through the other side of it. I did the work, I healed myself and then I got it all back and yes. that fuck didn't destroy me 
and didn't destroy that beautiful place that meant so much to everybody and we got it back and fuck yes. him you know and it just is so incredibly meaningful for all those people to see that um you know that your life doesn't have to be totally destroyed and I love um that. Yeah, so I love that. I just I, I just got to I just got to figure it out somehow. Make it Listen, happen. I have no doubt that you're going to build incredible things again. I have no doubt, no doubt. In this, in the time I've spent talking to you, um, this time and previously, I have no doubt that you're going to create yeah. amazing things again. I um, it, it's, it's, I just I have a. Uh, I, I mean, you can imagine now. I'm so. The idea of getting the right people involved that I can trust yes. is a yes. big issue, you know, cause it's, yes. it's, um, I mean, I just, it's like, I've, I've been through the ringer with people not being who they said they are. And I, of course, like, yeah, don't want to, don't want to do that ever again. <laughs> I can very much relate to that. Um, right? I'm very, very careful with my friendships. Yeah. Very, very careful. And, so, and, and business partners. Oh, especially. Yeah. Um, where can people find you, um, to follow your ad- adventures um well i post mostly on instagram um i am a kind of one uh, one person you know so i don't really follow up on facebook or um i'm not even on tiktok i think i have an account but i never used it um so i'm I'm mostly on instagram um i do have a patreon which uh hasn't quite been what i wanted it to be but i would Mm -hmm. love it if people came there it's sort of morphed into um my posts tend to be pretty personal and focused on healing yeah. and sort of the things that work for me. And, um, yeah. and you know, so there, there, you know, there's a couple recipes that I posted early on, but it's not going to be like, you know, as much about food or whatnot, but it's, yeah. it's kind of mostly more personal stuff about my own healing process. What's it's, your, it's, um, what's your, um, Patreon URL? Uh, it's, it's patreon.com Sarma Sarma. It's my first Sarma. name okay. twice, yeah. Oh, sweet. And, and um, your Instagram handle? Uh, that's my full name. So Sarma Melangilis, yeah. Yeah. You know, Melangilis no. is not the easiest the easiest name to say. No, I would have. I mean, on on Twitter, uh, I'm just going to keep calling it Twitter forever. Um, yeah. My handle is just at Sarma. Uh, and I, I wish I could have that everywhere. But um, Right, right. Yeah. I, I'm, yeah, I would, I would. I would be glad to just go by Sarma. But the useful thing about having my full name is that uh, uh, there's nobody else with that name. Nobody. Nobody. Yeah. So yeah. Um, there are a couple of imposter accounts, but they're not Of course. Me. They're always yeah. all right. Sarma, thank you so much for spending time with me and for being so open with me. Yeah, thank you. This has been, I mean, I knew that I don't do a lot of podcasts these days because I'm just trying to, you know, lay yeah. lay low while I work on work some things out but yeah. you're you have helped me so much through listening to your appearances on other podcasts uh your entire podcast all your discussions of this um you know you've definitely helped me figure some things out and helped me along my healing process so um I'm really grateful for what you're doing too and I can't wait for your film <laughs> oh we're going to talk more about that we need to do a follow-up yeah. when when that comes out Yeah, I'm excited. I'm looking forward to it.